could have. I'll see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not interested anymore. I'll be done with your talk for a history. <laughs> okay, good morning. Uh, good morning. Open to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Um, okay, with regard to the ranch trip, uh, there were 47 people that. Um, 47 people. That's not boring. <laughs> 47 uh, people trusted Christ. Amen. And then we wow. had a number of others that made decisions either for assurance or just uh, you know, the, the personal things that they were asked to pray for. Uh, but as far as we know, there's 47 that, that trusted Christ uh, during the trip. We had uh, just a little under like 40 people uh, that come from all over. And uh, it was Lord really blessed we were able to give out. Um, I don't have an exact number as far as the amount of literature. We were able to give out a lot. So we left with a whole lot less than what we came there with. And then as well, um, for the most part, the week uh, went pretty smoothly. We didn't really have any complications. And uh, even weather was really nice for the most part, except for the, the last day. But other than that, uh, it, was, it was actually pretty warm for, for up there this time of year. Uh, Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Uh, we'll start in uh, verse 1. So then came... To Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the transgression or the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and uh, said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Uh, for God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curses father or mother, let him die the death. Okay, right. uh, but ye say, uh, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And other not his father or his mother, uh, he shall be free. Uh, thus you have made the commandment of God of an effect by your uh, tradition. And, uh, well, read on. Ye hypocrites, ye uh, well did Isaiah uh, prophesy of you, saying, uh, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me, unearth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Okay, this week we're going to be looking at um, rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism, that's what's practically worshipped today as far as with regard to anybody that is religiously active as a Jew. Um, it's generally thought that it was started as far as the, the rabbinic tradition uh, is going back as far as second century, uh, but it really didn't take, as I guess you could say, strong foothold until sixth century, and that would be following the destruction of the temple. Um, you had not, well, we see this here, because uh, if you go back um, to Ezra and even into Nehemiah, after you have Israel in captivity, uh, you have worship of God still transpiring, but you don't have uh, access to the temple unless you were of the remnant that remained in Jerusalem. Uh, so you have individuals, uh, Ezra being one, uh, who himself was a scribe, but he was a priest. He was actually of Levitical heritage to be able to go ahead and uh, carry out uh, proper worship that um, the generation that would be in captivity, uh, not necessarily that would die, but of the younger that would be raised up in captivity, uh, we would read in Ezra that they would have to be explained the word of God. In other words, when Ezra uh, would teach, he would be one, uh, he had prepared his heart, obviously, to teach, uh, to teach in Israel's statutes and judgments. But he, uh, good morning, good morning. We're in Matthew 15, Matthew 15. So you can say even as far back as uh, Israel's initial captivity, uh, not just into Babylon, but then later, in, which would uh, exchange empires to the Persian Empire, that you would have the start of the rabbinic Judaism. Um, they would hold, and as a tenet of which, you have that they have beyond just the fact of Levitical law that's given, uh, the written law that's uh, obviously recognized that God gave a Mount Sinai, uh, and then that Moses would later on repeat uh, that there was an oral tradition that would, uh, that 
basically goes alongside uh, with what is written. And then that holds equal weight with uh, the written word. Uh, and that would not be preserved in writing as far as the oral tradition, the oral law, uh, until roughly it's believed to be about sixth century. And then what you have beyond just the written um, and the oral is you have the Talmud, which would basically be uh, commentary on uh, written and oral. So oral is actually uh, not just oral tradition, but also as far as you have uh, interpretation of the written law. And so it's considered, um, the view is as such, when when God gives a command, you know, uh, say for instance, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit murder, uh, thou shalt not, um, and then you can go down the line. Uh, everybody's like, well, okay, what, define murder then, or define thievery, or define, I know mean, that seems kind of silly, but it seems, okay, it's like very vague. So what they did was they, they um, what a lot of the, the scribes would do is that they would add they would, okay, well, we'll give interpretation to what we believe he's meaning here, and then we would build a fence. Uh, you can see throughout Israel's history that they had a problem with uh, idolatry and then following other gods and not giving heed uh, to God's word altogether. So what they would do is that in oral tradition particularly, uh, but also in uh, later on what would be Talmud is that you have addition to what was already given. So in other words, what they want to do is, use, and it's common human nature. If you are cautious about violating something, then what you would do is you would set up a rule to kind of guard you as a fence from go ahead and violating that rule altogether. So if you're told, um, whatever, don't go past five feet. So you'd say, okay, let's build a fence at three feet. So you don't go past it, so in case you do, then you're so you're you're kept behind from the five feet altogether, so you don't have uh, punishment or judgment of God. But the problem with it was is that uh, that was held to a higher standard, and then that was something that would take over uh, what what God actually had said, and so it held equal weight, even though it wasn't actually uh, God's God's divine revelation. We see here uh, in Matthew, and this is. We can say as far back as even from Ezra's time, uh, from the initial captivity going forward, but certainly past uh, the time of Christ, certainly past uh, going into the book of Acts, uh, and then forward, uh, even to present day. Uh, what you have is, as with the Pharisees, is what he uh, accused them of, was the fact that they teach for commandments the, tr uh, the tradition of men. So yeah. they don't hold necessarily to the word, even though the word itself is revered as obviously inspired, uh, but it's not uh, what holds weight in their personal life necessarily. Uh, they hold rather to what would be the Mishnah and the Talmud, so basically the oral tradition and then what would be the interpretation of it, uh, which the Talmud is, I guess you could, it, you could equate it to a uh, commentary on uh, rabbi's commentaries on what they believe, okay, the scripture's teaching here, uh, this portion or that portion. And so that that's really what ends up being that they follow. Since you don't have a temple at which you can offer sacrifices, and you don't have really by which, you, you know, is, well, up until 1948, after the dispersion, after Israel was basically kicked out of Israel, uh, the Jews were kicked out of Israel and the temple destroyed. Uh, they're all over, and so now, okay, they don't have a homeland, um, and you know they don't have anywhere to go worship God as prescribed in law. So, what do you do at that point? Yes. I heard that the Jews have like 618 laws. Is this that partly where this comes from, or is that? No, that's actually you have 613 laws. That's like in the law. That, that's that's what we have in scripture. 
Like you actually have 613 commandments that are given uh, in the law. We, we're most familiar obviously with the 10, but the law itself, see Israel is not just religious, but also it's, it's, a, it's a nation. So the law given was to govern as far as civilly, and then you have moral law, and then you have as well as far as like the, um, or for lack of a better term, really the religious law, in other words, the gov governing worship uh, and, and, and things of that nature. So it was it was it was all encompassing as far as for them, but there were 613 that they were given that we have recorded here, and then anything that um, you would see followed as far as like uh, basically added on would be tradition. Uh, that, as far as not 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 preserved for us in scripture. Um, your the Mishnah and the Talmud are basically man's opinions on what they think God's law is. And then what they do is they hold that I mean, that's really what it is. That's what a commentary is. Um, any uh, not to knock master, not to knock anybody, but if you were to read a commentary or, not, or even listen to, you know, <laughs> he's faithful to give us the word of God, but in essence, that's what it would be, you know, because you can take the word of God, you know, yourself, and it would help the Holy Spirit. You know, it, he's, it, Scripture says of itself that it's of no private interpretation. So if you are open to instruction, seeking God's will, um, you know, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you, you're going to arrive to the same conclusion that I would as far as when you're reading a portion of Scripture uh, based on what God had originally intended to the original recipient of it. Does it make sense? All right, so yeah, so then what they do is they basically you'll have um, commentary, added commentary or opinions of, okay, this is what I think this means, this is what I think that means. But they hold that as equal to, or actually in practice they hold it higher than, because that's really what they adhere to, that's really what they're studying. They go to. Um, they have seminaries that they call yeshivas, and that's what, for any of the rabbis. they you know, anybody wants to become a rabbi, they go to a yeshiva to go ahead and study. It'd be, in essence, it'd be okay. Like, okay, somebody wants to become a pastor, you want, you go to a seminary, you go to Bible college, uh, they go study the Word of God. So, with them, but it, rather than actually studying uh, Torah, instead of actually studying Scripture itself, you're studying really the commentaries on scripture. And so they, that holds, in practice, I'm just saying in practice, it holds higher value to them than it would the actual, you know, the word itself. Does that, I'm sorry, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know there was a lot of laws in the Old Testament. I never counted them, but of course, there were 600 laws. Yeah, 613. Okay. Yeah. But not all of them are... But those were like Yes. Yeah. I thought maybe that was extra stuff they had. No. No. Thank you. Okay, now within modern Judaism, as far as what we know, you have roughly about, well, even probably more segment than this, but you have three main groups as a, that you would encounter. Uh, reform. Conservative and Orthodox, okay, and then now the names kind of give away somewhat as far as what their ideology goes by. Uh, conservative, basically meaning that they want to conserve Jewish tradition, uh, and then Orthodox are more strict adherents. They would be more of the Pharisees, I guess you could say, as far as they were looking to actually observe uh, strictly. Uh, what would be written law in an oral, oral tradition. Uh, so whereas, whereas the difference between conservative and reform is that they don't hold, uh, they're, they're more socially aware, I guess you could say, uh, and reform being the most uh, like liberal of the three. So they, they, they would view themselves as, um, <laughs> if you, if you look at it, like I said, being almost similar, like in the evangelical circles, if you look back to uh, history of fundamentalism, uh, where you have 1800s, everybody starts jumping back and wagon on, okay, well, 
you know, maybe the Bible is really not the Word of God. Uh, with the new findings in science that they'd say that, okay, well, evolution is really true. Uh, we need to focus more on a social gospel. So in other words, you know, the focus on is here and now rather than on the eternal. So they don't view the eternal necessarily as uh, having equal weight or of really high value uh, than would be the here and now. Um, so you, in the same sense as that you have um, you might have people that are actual genuine believers, but they give their time to, and again, these things aren't necessarily bad, uh, to, you know, running a soup kitchen or uh, some kind of a charity of that nature. But they view that as being, okay, this is paramount. Now, granted, the Word of God does teach that, uh, you know, in James, that, uh, you know, we're supposed to visit the fatherless and the widows uh, in their time of affliction, um, and you know we're you know give unto those that, that are in need. Uh, but everybody's primary issue is sin; it's a spiritual issue that they have. And um, what? Well, <laughs> as with anything, okay, what good would it be if you, you give somebody to eat, um, but you don't share with them the gospel? What, what good? Seriously, what, what, what good is it? Okay, you know, you help them get a house. Uh, you help them physically. I mean, yeah, it, it gives them another day to go ahead and live, uh, but you don't share it with them about what they really have issue with, which is sin in their life, and how to deal with that, and how to have forgiveness, how to be able to have you know uh, a relationship with God altogether. And so they usually end up uh, overlooking one for the other. And so that, that, that would be the idea with regard to reform, is that they're looking to reform uh, Judaism, but it's also you know progressive or liberal uh, Judaism. But all three revolve around the same tenet, basically, is that uh, holding to the, what would be given in the Talmud and given in the Mishnahs, which is oral law and, and or oral tradition and, and the commentary on that, that it's your works. In other words, for me to have a right relationship with God is going to come down to basically being a good person, working. It, it's always going to end up coming down to the fact that I work towards um, getting a right relationship with God. So in other words, I'm accepted of God by my works rather than just realizing, hey, I need to trust God altogether by faith. They wholesale, uh, well, for the most part, we, when we read in John chapter 1 that he came into his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him, that gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the Jewish nation wholesale, by and large, uh, rejected him as far as the leadership. Uh, we, we, we read in scripture that through the Gospels, obviously, there's many that came to believe on him uh, individually, but as a, as a nation wholesale, they, they reject him as Messiah. And it's still today. Uh, they don't look towards um, Christ as having been Messiah. They don't look towards him as being anything other than, well, he's somebody that uh, brings upon us a lot of negative things. Uh, they hold primarily uh, Christ and Christians responsible for a lot of the atrocities that have gone on uh, in history with regard to the Jews. Uh, by the way, the Holocaust in uh, 19, basically stretching from 1939 until 1944, 1945, it was not the only time that there was a Holocaust in Israel's history. We can go through scripture and we can see uh, that there were countless times. Um, one of their holidays as well, uh, Purim, though that one was particularly averted by God. Uh, the fact was that that would have been a great Holocaust uh, that would have transpired within their history. So it's it's not the only time, you know, Satan's been actively trying to destroy Israel uh, from a very long time. But nevertheless, they they hold Christians and uh, Christ responsible for a lot of the atrocities that have transpired against them as a people and as a nation. So, when approaching them, 
one of the many things as far as with regard to um, bringing light to them uh, is just bringing that awareness of the fact that what this is not uh, one it wasn't God's will because Israel is still you know the apple of God's eye two um, as with anything else anybody can call themselves you can put any label on them you know somebody calls himself a Christian somebody that's uh, posing themselves as a follower of Christ but hates Israel in reality they're being disobedient if they really are genuine Christian then they're really being, they're being disobedient uh, if you know they're not then obviously they're not but uh, you know scripture is pretty clear on how you know given litmus test with regard to okay who's <laughs> if you're obedient to Christ or not you know uh, somebody could be a believer that's going to be obedient to scripture you know you're going to believe God with regard to Israel beyond this fact that they're the apple of God's eye but as he stated to Abraham that I will bless them that bless the person that cursed thee you know um, so you, you're not going to have if you're going to be right with God a hatred towards uh, God's chosen people Now, with regard to uh, tenets, it's pretty clear. We can, um, they don't hold to the New Testament uh, because they say it's, you know, from Christianity and Christians. But the fact is, um, with the exception of Luke, uh, all writers of the New Testament were Jewish. Okay, so the New Testament's a Jewish book as well. Uh, it's obviously given by God, it's inspired by God, uh, it's preserved by God, and it's God's word. If you're going to approach uh, somebody, you would still give them the gospel as you would anybody else. If you know whether you're going to approach a, a, a Jewish individual, you're going to still have to give them the gospel because uh, it's you know only through Christ that someone gets salvation. Uh, so regardless if they don't want to hear it, you would, you would still go ahead and uh, give it to them. There are a number of places where you can go in the Old Testament that are very clear with regard to who Christ was. Uh, Isaiah 53 being the absolutely clearest and best. And Daniel chapter 9. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 in particular, you have beyond just the fact that it's told uh, and it's, it's later clarified, well I don't say clarified, but it's later, you get a little more in depth uh, Isaiah 53 but we're told as far as with regard to Messiah that he would be cut off for his people we're given specifically as far as when that would happen um, if you were to do the math on it uh, there's no way that in other words for what they're looking for now and waiting for Messiah saying that oh, Christ can have been Messiah you know because Messiah was supposed to come and he was supposed to set up a kingdom He's supposed to liberate Israel. Uh, the fact is, you know, they want to reject the fact that Christ had come. Uh, the time's already way past for, for Messiah to have come according to uh, what Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, so if they want to reject that, the fact is, okay, it's not possible for anybody else to be able to go ahead and fulfill uh, what Daniel said in Daniel chapter 9 uh, according to the timetable that he had given of when he was to arrive. So that that's very clear um, there. And obviously, as, as I've already uh, uh, mentioned, Isaiah 53, uh, that he would be uh, wounded for our transgressions, and that, you know, he would be for our iniquities, and by the chastisement, by his chastisement, you know, we would be healed. Uh, and then again, you know, he would die not for his own sin, but for the sins of the people. Please God to bruise him. So Messiah would not. By the way, this is that isn't the only place where it's mentioned that Messiah would have to be cut off. Uh, Jesus, when speaking to the disciples, they knew they didn't want him to die necessarily. Uh, they would overlook, I think, in cases the fact that it was clear from prophecy that he would have to be cut off. Um, but if you're honest with scripture, you have to look and see, okay, he, he very clearly stated in a number of different places that he was to be cut off. 
other words, that Messiah was not only just to come to reign and rule, set up kingdom, but he would have to be cut off. He would have to die for sin. Mind you, not his own sin, for the sins of the people uh, as an offering so that we would be reconciled to God. But uh, he, he would have to be cut off. He would have to die. And Messiah is coming back. He's returning. Okay, he will set up kingdom. Uh, he will reign and rule on the earth. Uh, he will reign in uh, justice. Uh, but that is still pending, and we're still, that's part of the blessed hope that we're looking forward to as far as when he will return. Uh, does any, anybody have any questions? Honestly, it depends on their background. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, sir, well, it depends on their background. Most most of the times they'll tell you, "Oh, I'm Jewish." Okay, that's fine. Um, the the fact is, you have many. Most American Jews don't have any real connection to scripture. It's. Honestly, most aren't practicing. I, I mean, I can wish I could give you a number estimate as far as uh, when I worked in Hollywood. Okay, when I worked at that uh, gated community, I'd say probably yeah, I lived, I lived in I'd say upwards of fifty percent of the of the the people that lived there were uh, were Jewish. Okay, I mean, you go down like three blocks down from where I was working in, and that's a whole another. Uh, like you have an Orthodox gated community back that way, and then you have a like synagogue pretty much almost every other block uh, down down Sterling there. But uh, anyways, most of the ones that I was able to talk to that were willing to talk to me, um, you know, they didn't become practicing until later in life. You know, they didn't grow up practicing necessarily. Most of them just lived like any like like pagan. They were. <laughs> you had a lot of atheist Jews. Yeah, I mean they keep tradition, but they don't. You know, so it, it depends on their background. I mean, like with anybody else, it depends on their background. It depends on how studied they are, and quite often it's going to be most of uh, either Mishnah or Talmud that they're going to be referring to. Uh, yes, sir. In many of the contexts I've had, it seems like the issue is the same whether they're Jewish or Gentile. You know, it's how does one have a relationship with God and how do you know that that relationship is acceptable, you know, to God. And, you know, you think of what Paul did. Paul didn't have the New Testament yet. He was writing it, you know, and he was becoming, but he reasoned with Scripture. He reasoned from the Old Testament. You start off with that relationship. You've got Malachi. You've got all sorts of passages, you know, Early, early on in Isaiah, how God is not satisfied with the sacrifices that were being offered. That you know that was inadequate. That was not sufficient. That you can't keep the law. Well, that leaves them in a real conundrum. Well, if you can't keep the law, so you can't satisfy God, how can you have a relationship with Him? And that's where God took the steps. You know, and yeah. God reached out to them. And you just have to reason from Scripture. And ideally, having a handle on their the scriptures they refer to most often. It's interesting that they re, they pretty much avoid Isaiah 53. And they don't they don't yeah, they there do. in their Bibles. You know? <laughs> and so you know work up to it. You know, but you know yeah, you know, we, we never get anywhere by attacking, you know, but by pointing out God reaching out to them. And that's what you know you read the you know you read the gospels you see time and again that people were turning to Christ and yet the legalists, the Pharisees, you know, they were they were resistant, offended, and turned away because they had their traditions. We have our traditions too, you know, that we add to scripture, you know, um, yeah. in, in our effort to keep scripture. They do too. Two things that came to mind when you're speaking, sir. Um, in Acts 17. In Acts 17, we get 
when you go through the whole book of Acts, you see it practically firsthand as far as how Paul addressed. And something that I found somewhat helpful in Acts 17, uh, verse 3. Uh, well, uh, verse 2 it says, and then Paul, as his manner was, went into, unto them, because he, 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 he's, at, he's at Thessalonica here at a synagogue of the Jews. And then reason, uh, and then three the days, reason with him out of the scriptures. And then uh, here's two things that he did as far as uh, in verse 3 he says, he opening and alleging that Christ, the first one is Christ must needs have suffered and then risen from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. In other words, okay. First off, just the concept of Messiah even dying, okay, Messiah having to be cut off, okay, that that's something that quite often is foreign. Uh, they, they, that that's a summing block, and then just so he first addresses that, and then now now that we've already covered the fact, okay, here, here's where Scripture is very clear that Messiah was prophesied to be cut off, uh, and then Christ is Messiah, you know, G, G, you know Jesus is Messiah. Uh, the other thing that's what you mentioned that, uh, that came to mind. But that, that, thank you, you're right. You're right, you're right with that, sir. Yes? A lot of times it's like family. I have a Jewish friend that I talk to a lot, and she loves hearing about the Bible and everything, but she's she's not a Yeah, that would be another thing too, as far as yeah, you're right on that. That yeah, you'd have that abandonment basically. Oh, you know, people are going to turn on me. I'm not going to have my close relationship with. Could be all the family. Just could be just immediate family, uh, as the case may be. And that they feel. Oh, um, uh, Philip Sablowski. Yeah. Yeah. He started uh, all the three ministries. He's from out west, like out in Sarasota area. Was he? Was he? Was he down here? Not recently. Okay. Not recently. He's what? our he's our neighbor in Fort Worth. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> we have his video that they we have show. A heritage night every fourth Friday in their church in, in uh, Weatherford. But okay, wow. It's neat. Yeah, he was. Um, his material has been helpful. We've had uh, some of his video series that we'll show on occasion here uh, for, for Sunday school. But he would be one as far as um, that would have been, well, you've probably heard his testimony in your life. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was you know, kicked out of his home and then basically turned away. Yes. We have that same concern with Muslims. Uh, I found it with Catholics. Catholics yeah. I know with Catholic families that when a child comes to Christ, they're totally you know, forsaken by their families. They've abandoned the faith. I mean, that happens all the time in relationships, even within Christian relationships. The wife comes to Christ, the husband is angry. You know, there's always that. That's why Christ said, you've got to love me more than you love your your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. You can't be, be my disciple. So there's always that, you know, that you're going to you're gonna face. And it comes down to, you know, who's, who and what is most important. Point. Yeah. And you're dealing with people. And the truth is... <laughs> It's the truth. They're not going to, they're not worth going to hell over. I love my dad. You know, I love, I love my mom. I love my family. Uh, but the fact is, you know, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> if I were to have listened, uh, at, well, my mom's saved now. My dad's still not. But um, if I would have listened to him at the time, you know, oh, this, that's just a cult. You know, they're going to brainwash you, whatever this and that. The fact is, you know, I, you know the Holy Spirit conviction in your heart. That's true. And the fact is, um, that relationship's not worth, worth going to hell over. It's, it's really what it comes down to. Yeah. And I've, the thing is, is, there's nothing that you give up in this life uh, that you won't be restored ten, you know, hundredfold, basically. In this life or in the next, you know, Christ will come in, and then you know He'll be your father, He'll be your friend, He'll be your brother. Uh, he's going to bless abundantly. 
you know. And the, again, there's no, there's no, there's no comparison. There's really no relationship with going out over, uh, regardless of how close it be and uh, how, you know how long that relationship is. Isaiah nine. That was the only other one that I remember now. Isaiah nine. Isaiah nine six. That we're told as far as that, uh, uh, you know, unto us a, a uh, son is born, unto us a child is given, and then his name is, uh, his name shall be called uh, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, you know, Prince of Peace. Um, they don't want to go to Isaiah fifty three, which a lot of most of them won't, unless they're very like just liberal and you know they're willing open to talk to you. Uh, Isaiah nine would be, it's not the only scripture, but I'm just saying, why would you call somebody that's born, a child that's born, you know, everlasting God, you know, or everlasting Father, you know, the mighty God, everlasting Father. How do you explain that? You know, so that's obviously supernatural. In other words, this child is not just, you know, uh, in Micah 5 too, he's from, his, his comings were from uh, old of everlasting. So in other words, he's, this is a supernatural individual. We know, you know, Messiah is to come, but Jesus, I mean, obviously Jesus is Messiah. But, uh, you know, he's not just a prophet. You know, he's, he's God Almighty in flesh. But, um, okay, is, uh, any more questions or comments? Okay. Uh, all right, so for next week, uh, we'll be looking at uh, Islam. We'll be looking at Islam for uh, next week. Right. We're just going to